Okay, so uh, everybody got the homework turned in okay, it looked like, over the weekend. Yeah, my other class, Mastering, that uses Mastering Biology. That's what everybody, he, yeah, I get the same response to that sometimes, too. It, it actually, uh, it, it turned every, it assigned everybody's assignment as late, even though they were turning it in on time completely. I had like 15 emails where everybody said it was too late and it wasn't. I'll get our next homework posted here pretty soon, uh, probably t um, by early tomorrow morning, and it'll be due again on, on Sunday night. So everybody's good with that? Okay, good. And you like the way the folders are with everything in there? Okay, good. So it's pretty easy to follow along with. All right. Uh, just for some, just as a heads up, I'm sure most of you know by now that there is going to be some really crazy winter weather coming our way that is going to start hitting probably tomorrow. And as some of you heard me talking just, you know, a few minutes ago, I live east of the mountains, like pretty far out. And in all honesty, if it's snowy out there and you hear the East Mountain schools are closed, I probably won't decide to drive in if there's a lot of snow on the road. I wouldn't expect you to either. So uh, pay attention for school closures on Thursday. Uh, also check your email just to make sure that I don't, um, I decide not to come in. I mean, if the storm doesn't do anything, it's just cold, I'll, I'll be happy to come in, but I'm not driving through feet of snow to, to come lecture. I'm sorry. And school might, I mean, like I said, there, there might be closures. So just, just keep an eye on that and then keep an eye on your email Thursday morning. Good. Or even Wednesday afternoon, because if, like I said, there's a foot of snow on Wednesday afternoon. There's, I'm not going to be able to make it in. Yeah, I have four-wheel drive, but it, it get, <laughs> that, doesn't, that doesn't help you too much on a highway. Yeah, exactly. Okay, um, I think that was all. I just want to give you guys a heads up. Like I said, it's a good chance that classes, I won't be holding class on Thursday, but we'll see. We'll just play it by ear. And if I don't hold class, what I'm going to do is I'm going to just go ahead and lecture at 930 in the morning. And I'll just do it at home and it'll be live. And then it'll be posted so you guys will have that. Okay? All right. Yeah, I got people... Hi, everybody out there on the web. I ended last week with a discussion on abiogenesis. And does anybody have any questions or comments about that? No? So we've got these miller Ure experiments. You guys remember what that was about? Yeah, what was the importance of that experiment? What did we learn from it? That we could create... Uh organic compounds without necessarily having life already introduced to it. Absolutely. Yeah, exactly. The Miller-Urey experiments, he started with very simple molecules of like water and methane and carbon dioxide. And I forget all the things he put in there. But the point was, is that with these very simple precursor molecules and a little bit of an input of energy, the spark, right? He got all these different organic molecules. The basic building blocks of life are easy to make. They're really easy to make, like amino acids, simple carbs, pyruvate, and acetaldehyde. Those were easy to make as well. And I, I felt a little sad the book didn't go into that. They talked about the formaldehyde, but pyruvate is, uh, and acetaldehyde is very similar. They, uh, I think pyruvate or pyruvic acid, and this is a three carbon. Uh oh, I may have started something I can't finish here. There we go. I think that's it. You'll see this. This is the, the breakdown. This is the end result of glycolysis and cellular respiration, which you guys will get to later in the semester with Dr. Adama. But this molecule right here, that's a precursor for a lot of different things. And so is acetaldehyde. If you notice, there's two carbons here. This is a precursor to both amino acids, uh, carbs, lipids, and nucleic acids, right? Our bodies will actually, our cells at the cellular level, will take these two molecules here and pull them out of cellular respiration and use them for anabolic reactions to make all kinds of things, including the four classes of macromolecules. So to me, in the miller era experiments, that was really exciting. I wasn't around for that one. And of course, they took it back in the 1950s. 
So that was a, a really big benefit of that or a big discovery of that experiment. Now, the next question is, why has not life kind of emerged out of the Miller array experiments? I mean, that's what the critics would say, right? Like, well, I, I don't see anything crawling out of that flask. Life never showed up in that, in that flask in the experiment. Why is that? Would we ever see life emerge from the Miller Ura experiments? Yeah, some of you are shaking your head no, and you're absolutely right. Why is that? That's a tough question. This sounds like a good uh, a good exam question. I got two people raising their hands actually. Okay, you go first. Um, because you have to be out of the to absolutely. You have life is a system that is out of equilibrium with its environment. Do you want to add to that or that was what you were going to say? Absolutely. So when the book talks about what is life and it gives you this list of five characteristics and it says, hey, we use energy you know, to reproduce, maintain homeostasis. What life is actually doing is using that energy to create order lower entropy at the level of the system. And by doing that, right, that's that's what life is doing, is, is creating order. A living system is out of equilibrium with its environment. The problem with the miller ure experiment is this. How do you get those molecules in a system and that system out of equilibrium with the rest of that flask? It's all mixed up, right? So by thinking about life as this system out of equilibrium with this environment, then we can start looking for natural geological formations that would create conditions at the system level, right? They were out of equilibrium with the environment. And thermal vents, the hot vents are, are, are probably our best answer for that. So really helped us out, the military experiments, but it, there is a big gaping hole. Like you, you just can't get cells arising in a homogenized mixture. So this, of course, led to uh, or helped with a prebiotic soup model that was coined. I always thought by JBS Haldane in the 1929. Turns out somebody else coined it as well. But the point is, is if you have all of these organic molecules floating around in an ocean, you're very much unlikely to get life emerging from a prebiotic soup floating around in the oceans. Okay, are we good? All right, any other questions on this? Yeah, okay, well, I talk about this a lot because like I said, the book has this running theme of, of chemical evolution leading to the evolution of life. We talk about molecules and leading up to cells. And uh, so my theme here is, let's, let's think about what life does as being an action versus a set of characteristics, okay? All right. Yeah. Okay, so let's start chapter three. And like I said, I'm going to do about a chapter a week up until about the last two or three weeks where we're gonna do uh, six and seven. I'll take, two, I'll take a little extra time for those, for those chapters. But for right about now, we're gonna go about a chapter a week. And right now, um, we're on chapter three, protein structure and function. So we're going to talk about amino acids, how you link amino acids together to form proteins. We're going to talk about what proteins look like. And of course, um, shape matters, form and function. So proteins have a 3D, three-dimensional shape. And that three-dimensional shape determines its function. And we'll talk about how it gets into that 3D shape as well. And then of course, uh, we'll talk about the versatility of proteins. What's interesting, it's a book, I, I think I've taught through three or four editions of this book now. And that, yeah, I've been, and they, they move things around so they can call it a new edition, right? And one thing they did is they moved section 3.4, the last section, the versatility of proteins to the back when it, you started out in the front. Just saying. So let's start with the end. 
let's start with why proteins matter. And I think it's important to start talking about proteins and what they do and why they matter before we get into the nuts and bolts of how proteins work, because let's make a connection to them. When we understand something and why they're important, then it's easier to understand the rest of it or learn the rest of it. At least it is for me. Proteins are incredibly versatile. And there's an enormous number of proteins out there. And the potential, the potential for the number of proteins is in the billions. I don't know how many proteins are made by life, but I would suspect they're in the millions. I think humans alone have about 100,000, give or take. So as you can see, they're used for enzymes, the speed of chemical reactions, structure, movement, signaling, transport, and defense. And let's, let's take a closer look at each one of these. Structural proteins. You know, these are like um, proteins that you would find whenever a butterfly will, uh, makes a cocoon or a uh, spider makes silk. Silk is proteins, very strong, versatile proteins too. They're elastic, but they're stronger than steel in some cases. Um, collagen, in AMP this, this week, I'm talking about our connective tissue. So collagen that holds us together. Collagen is what forms like your, your tendons and your ligaments. And it's a unique protein to animals. And like I said, that's a, a structural one. Keratin fibers. Your skin has uh, uh, these keratin fibers in there, and those are also structural as well. And uh, when we start talking about the cell and the cytoskeleton, you'll learn that keratin are the intermediate filaments and that uh, they're part of that cytoskeleton that gives cells their shape and rigidity. Oh yeah, I think I tried for a couple decades to look like Arnold. I never quite achieved it. <laughs> he had a couple more pharmaceuticals and probably a little better genetics than I did, or I do. So, of course, that's Conan the Barbarian, and that's him practicing with his broadsword. And for any of you that really like fantasy and sci-fi, there's actually a YouTube video where somebody turned his sword into a lightsaber, and he's out there practicing with a sword lightsaber. I'm just saying. There's fun stuff on YouTube. But what I'm showing here is that proteins form, as you well know, your muscles, your contractile protein. And muscles are unique to animals. Animals are the only life on Earth that makes proteins. I mean, sorry, that makes muscles. And of course, uh, it's uh, actin and myosin form are the proteins that form most of your muscles, and they're used for movement because they attach to your skeleton. Now, in addition to skeletal muscle, they are also used in movement at the cellular level. The uh, cilia, the flagella that will beat back and forth, those are made up of microtubules, which are proteins involved with the cytoskeleton. There are also numerous transport vesicles inside of your cells and they don't just wander around the cell there's actually motor proteins right here that attach to these transport vesicles and those motor proteins walk right down microtubules and in lab if you ever look at like uh, the elodea leaf that aquatic plant and you see the little chloroplast moving around it's called cytoplasmic streaming that's caused by motor proteins and actin filaments. So like I said, within the cell, there is a lot of movement done by motor proteins. There's also awesome YouTube videos on that as well. If anybody just type in motor proteins to YouTube. Oh, wrong, wrong computer. We are a multicellular organism. And all animals are multicellular organisms, and so are plants. And one thing that a multicellular organism must do 
is coordinate, <coughs> excuse me, is coordinate the activities of all of those cells. So in a human, we're 17, 20 trillion cells. And all of those cells need to work together. And you have to coordinate their efforts. And one way you do that is, well, cell signaling. So proteins are involved with not only the signaling molecules themselves, like uh, oxytocin. You ever heard of oxytocin? You know that warm, fuzzy feeling you get when you look into your dog's eyes or your significant other? Well, they're getting that same feeling too because oxytocin affects our, our, our affections toward each other. And it's also involved with uh, childbirth too. Your, your oxytocin levels go way high. And if you induce labor, they, they hit you with what's called pitocin, which is basically oxytocin. It's only nine amino acids long, but it's called the love hormone. You should look it up. It's pretty cool stuff. But that's a signaling molecule. It sends signals throughout your body. Cells can also communicate adjacent to each other. Uh, for example, your skin. Your skin stops growing when it grows together. But then if you cut yourself, you know, your skin will grow back and heal, right? That signaling molecule is involved with that. Not only do uh, our proteins involved with the actual of the signals themselves, they're also the signal receptors. So when you guys later this semester start talking about cell signaling, you're going to learn about something called a G protein coupled receptor or receptor tyrosine kinase. So it's a lot, but basically there's just this protein right here. It's called a G protein. And this is the receptor. And basically for a cell to have a response from a, uh, from a signal, it has to have some receptor to receive that signal and then transmit that signal into the cell so the cell can respond. Good? Okay. And there's lots of G protein coupled receptors that you'll learn about with, uh, with Dr. Adama. They're, they're quite fascinating. People study these all the time in, uh, in pharmacy and in biochemistry. So there's, there's yeah. And in fact, um, people that are HIV resistant that like don't really get infected with HIV, uh, even though they get exposed, has to do with differences in their pro G protein coupled receptors. So kind of cool stuff. They inherited it from the plague, I think, from their ancestors that were resistant to the plague. Oh, did you hear? First vaccination trials for HIV. Yeah. Yeah, we're, we're in a golden age right now. I keep pushing the wrong button there. So proteins are also involved with, uh, with transport. And this is transport at the cellular level. This is something that I will talk about. And I, I actually really enjoy talking about transport. So you've got a cell that's surrounded by a membrane. And not everything can easily cross that membrane. Your electrolytes. They don't cross a membrane very easily. And so our cells spend a lot of energy moving electrolytes and regulating electrolytes across that membrane. They need it for everything from water balance to creating stomach acid in your stomach to sending a nerve signal to muscle contractions. So it's um, incredibly important. And I'm just showing a couple different types of transport proteins in these cases, there's a sodium potassium pump on the right. This pumps sodium out of cells, pumps potassium in the cells. And uh, I think like 20% of your metabolic energy goes to those things right there. That's how important they are. You also, uh, you have ion channels that can open and close that will passively allow ions to enter or exit a cell. So um, like our nerve system, our nervous, our nerves, they rely on some of those um, ion or ligand gated channels. Actually, it'd be a voltage gated. That's the action potential. Yeah. Yep. They'll open up the, the voltage gated ion channels. It's a lot of words, voltage gated ion channel, but just think ions, right? That's a charged particle. Gated means there's a gate on there. Voltage, think like a battery, right? That's the difference in charge between your plus and your minus. 
So if you have a voltage gated ion channel, there's an ion channel. It'll allow an ion to go through and it opens or closed based on the voltage across the membrane. And of course, proteins are involved with defense as well. Antibodies. You know, we take antibiotics and anti but these things will basically, they help fight disease. So yeah, proteins. And of course, another thing that proteins are do that is very important is they speed up chemical reactions. Most molecules are fairly stable. They're, they're not going to do much. But what uh, these proteins do, these enzymes, is they're able to speed up chemical reactions. And in fact, some enzymes might be able to like facilitate 25 million reactions a second. <laughs> you know, at the cellular level, things just are so much faster than the way we experience life. And... Uh, if anybody is interested in, in physics, especially quantum mechanics, it turns out that some of our models of how we thought enzymes work might not be totally, um, I don't want to say not totally correct, but might be incomplete, that it turns out that enzymes uh, um, actually use a, a method called quantum tunneling to help form new, new, to help break bonds and form new ones. And if anybody wants to know more about that, we can talk about it later. I don't want to get into that too much, but it's, it's quite fascinating that we use a quirk of quantum physics and biology because it was thought for years that we didn't need it, that it was just, they put everything in the right position and broke the bond and created a new one. And it turns out it's almost certainly more complicated. Oh, if you don't know what quantum tunneling is, I'm sorry. If you've got a mountain like this, and you have a ball right here, well, for us, we have to go over the mountain, right? So that's like your energy peak of whenever you break a bond. That's you, you have to do that energy. Quantum tunneling allows it to go through the mountain, basically. So you don't actually have to overcome the energy barrier. Pretty wild stuff. Okay, and this is just an old um, overview of proteins. It's, I just put it in the slide so you guys can look at that on your own. Okay, any questions about what proteins do? They do a lot, don't they? I mean, proteins are involved with almost every single aspect of our bodies. They're the workhorses, and they, they are incredibly versatile in what they can do. Anywhere from sending a signal to helping things move around to fighting diseases and speeding up chemical reactions. Now, the, a cool question to ask is how are proteins so versatile? What makes proteins so versatile? And why can there be millions of proteins and they do so many different things? Well, the answer begins with by understanding their building blocks. The building blocks of proteins are amino acids. For all you Star Trek fans out here, you know the, to uh, to understand or to remember how to draw the general form of an amino acid. Anybody that's a Star Trek fan will know NCC-1701, which is, of course, a USS Enterprise, NCC, Naval Construction Contract. But in biology, nitrogen, carbon, carbon, here's a, this is an amino acid. This R stands for a side group. There's a hydrogen right here. This is our amine group. And often inside of our cells, there'll be a hydrogen attached, attracted to that end. That is the general form of an amino acid. Hmm, there's our two carbons. And we're next talking about the precursor molecules. You can see it right there, attached to an amine group. Okay. 
life on this planet uses about 20 amino acids. The vast majority of life uses 20 amino acids. There are some bacteria out there that use a couple different ones, but in general, 20 amino acids. It's a, uh, that's it. There are more amino acids. Interestingly, we've, we've, uh, we found meteorites and they will analyze the meteorites for chemicals and they'll find amino acids on the meteorites, which is kind of cool. And you might be going, well, how do you know that's just not bacteria that colonize the meteor? And the answer is, is that on earth, all amino acids produced by life have chirality. You know what chiral chirality is? Yeah, they have right, they can be right and left-handed. So yeah, enantiomers, right? Non-superimposable mirror images. So all of the amino acids made by every living organism on this planet are all left-handed. So anybody ever taken uh, supplements before, like protein shakes? Yeah, my friends still call me peace shake for protein shake. Well, when I came here first, like in graduate school, I was competing, so I put my big five-pound bag of protein by the lab, and everybody saw it. And, been protein shake ever since. But if you look at the ingredients, there will be an L by the amino acid. And that L <clears throat> just means for left-handed. I think it's a German for left-handed, which is like leverous, I think. Anybody can correct me if you want. Yeah. But on this meteor, whenever they find uh, these amino acids, they found up to like 90 different amino acids that were created in space. And they were about an even mixture of right-handed and left-handed amino acids. So because there was a mixture, we knew that those amino acids were formed in, in space by non-biotic methods. Pretty wild, isn't it? Okay. So of course, amino acids, they're building blocks. And they polymerize into proteins. It's like you take Legos and you plumberize them into the Lego Millennium Falcon. Of course, I'm obsessed with wanting this. I can't wait for my daughter to ask for this. I'm just waiting. But the point is, is that that's a polymer. It's got a unique shape based on the shapes of the, of the, uh, of the building blocks. Proteins are the same way. Proteins have your building blocks. And which, or, and which amino acid you use can determine the shape of your overall protein. So even though there's 20 amino acids, we can break them up into or, div or divide them into hydrophilic or hydrophobic and even charged. You can see your functional groups. And like I said, when uh, this is put in water, uh, like a neutral pH, that, that hydrogen on the carboxyl group typically comes off. And because you're donating a proton, you're an acid, hence the name amino acid. Okay. So like I said, as you guys will know, this is not an element. This just stands for the side chain. And uh, so the R stands for the side chain. And there's a side chains. And if you see all the carbon and hydrogen in there, you can tell right off the bat, those are hydrophobic. Why is it hydrophobic? Why is a side chain hydrophobic? What can that side chain not do with water? Exactly. It cannot form a hydrogen bond with water. So these are hydrophobic. They're just carbon and hydrogen. Now, sometimes in like the, the tryptophan, there is a nitrogen in there, but there's a lot more carbon and hydrogen. So it would be mostly hydrophobic. And when we can, when we talk about things as being hydrophobic or hydrophilic, it's not an and or an, you know, it, it's a spectrum. Then go from completely hydrophobic to completely hydrophilic. But we would label all of these as hydrophobic. And as you can see, it's just mostly carbon and hydrogen, these nonpolar covalent bonds. These side chains are hydrophilic. And the first thing you notice in there, it's just got hydroxyl groups. 
It's got amine groups, carbonyl groups, even a sulfhydryl group like cysteine. Cysteine has sulfur in it. Cysteine is very important for like creating very strong proteins like your hair because uh, you form these, uh, the, the sulfur will form bridges using covalent bonds. So these, of course, can form hydrogen bonds with water and with themselves. Good? Okay. And then you have charged ones, and these are the carboxyl group. And one of the things about carboxyl groups and the pH of most cells is that hydrogen comes off. So that's why it's charged. And then the, the amine groups, they pick up an extra hydrogen. They're acting as a base, so they would be positively charged. Any questions? That's pretty straightforward stuff, right? I mean, anybody not understand or review, right? Now, the next thing uh, that we talk about is how do we link these amino acids together? Turn my camera here so the guys at home can see me here. Condensation or dehydration. So condensation, dehydration are basically the same thing. If you look carefully, you can see that there's amino acids. And right here, we've got our, this is our carboxyl group. This is the amine group. There's a OH, there's a H. When they link, that water comes out, hence the name condensation reaction, because water is coming out of it. It's also called dehydration because the molecule that you're forming, the protein, or specifically the polypeptide, is losing water, so we call it a dehydration. Okay, good with this? And then what happens is whenever the you have the link between the amino group and the carboxyl group, the, that o, the OH from the carboxyl comes out, so you've got carbon attached to nitrogen. It's shown as a single bond, and it's called a peptide bond. Now, interestingly, for those of you that know a little bit about chemistry, you'll see there is a carbonyl group. And that carbonyl group, the C double bonded to O, those electrons, so if I've got N, C, C here, we'll see. This is just my backbone here. So there's one amino acid. Here's a second amino acid. This is your peptide bond. Now, for those of you that have had organic chemistry, you know that Whenever you have a single covalent bond, these, these things can rotate around it. They could spin. However, because of this right here, this carbonyl group right here, what happens in this peptide bond is it's more like these electrons start getting shared here and here, which gives this the sort of double bond appearance. So it means a couple things. This bond is strong. Because even though we depict it as a single covalent bond, because these electrons are moving back and forth and resonating or moving back and forth here, what's happening is that this is much stronger and it prevents it from rotating. It locks it in because whenever you've got a double bond, this won't rotate and this won't rotate here. Okay. All right. So here's our condensation reaction, dehydration reaction. They're the exact same thing. And what's happening is you're taking your monomers, your monomers, of course, being your building blocks, in this case, the amino acids, and you're building a polymer. Poly just means many. 
you're building a polymer. And specifically, as we link amino acids together, we form what is called a polypeptide. So a string of amino acids are a polypeptide, okay? Form these peptide bonds that we just had. So some words that we always talk about, that we always use interchangeably, dehydration, condensation reaction, polymerization. If you're gonna polymerize your amino acids, you're building a polypeptide and also synthesis. So a polymerization is a synthesizing reaction. The synth means to put together. So if I synthesize a protein, I'm putting together a protein. Okay, good. That's just some foundational knowledge there on our words. Now remember, a polypeptide is like two or more amino acids, or even three more, because a dipeptide would be just two amino acids. All proteins are by default a polypeptide, every single protein. But not all polypeptides are proteins. Because a polypeptide can just be a string of amino acids with no function. Does that make sense? Or they might be part of a larger protein that I'll talk about here in a second. Okay. Now, as you might know, whenever you eat a eat eat protein, whenever you take in protein, you basically can't use those proteins as they are. So if you're eating a chicken or steak or fish for extra protein in your diet, your body doesn't incorporate cow protein into your muscle protein. What it does is it breaks apart the proteins down into its individual amino acids. So if we're building it up, it's a condensation reaction. And then if we break them down, it's a hydrolysis reaction. Hydrolysis. Hydro means water. Lysis means to split. So whenever you, you break down proteins, you're doing a hydrolysis reaction. Good? Yeah. Need water to have this happen. Okay. So of course there's directionality I'm just going to draw the backbone. You get your end terminus right here and your carboxyl terminus here. Okay. So your backbone of your polypeptide is, of course, your sequence of specific amino acids. Now we've got these R groups. So there's a carbonyl group. Oh, and now here we have the R, the R groups, and those are our side chains. And those side chains, as you see, they're they're pointed up. And those side chains are going to be important. And we'll talk about the structure, the overall structure of proteins here and where those side chains come in. So now that we know about amino acids, any questions? Are we all good with this? Anybody not understand? Lost? Every now and then I start talking way too fast. I just get excited about this stuff. If I, if I go too fast, you got to slow me down. I know, proteins are pretty wild stuff here. So here's the general structure of proteins. Primary structure, secondary structure, tertiary structure. Every protein will at least have a tertiary structure because that's your three-dimensional shape. So we got the first, the second, the third, and then some large proteins uh, have quaternary structure. And then we can even put a bunch of proteins together and form even higher level stuff like a protein complex. And once again, when you study like cellular respiration, you'll learn like the electron transport chain and the ATP synthase, the thing that actually makes your ATP. These are really large protein complexes. 
Okay, let's take a look. Let's look at these multiple layers or levels of protein structure. Oh, click that title. Yeah, okay. Let's get rid of that. Oh, doesn't want to work. Every protein has a primary structure. Primary. This is nothing more than your sequence of amino acids. That's all it is. Okay? And then when we learn about genes, you'll realize that like, the sequence of your nucleotides codes for your sequence of amino acids. That's the translating part, the translation and making proteins. But you can see it's got the amino end and the carboxyl end. So there is directionality to these, to these uh, um, primary structures. And the primary structure, of course, I mean, it goes without saying, is different for different proteins. Where you stick your, your regions of hydrophobic amino acids, where you stick your hydrophilic amino acids will affect how these proteins fold and how they interact with other parts of the cell, like whether or not they're in a membrane or they're floating around in the cytoplasm. And interestingly, um, small changes in a large protein can have big, big consequences. In some cases, it can render the protein non-functional or, or doesn't work as well. This, of course, is showing the amino acid glutamine changing to valine. And I think I forgot exactly what's happening. The exact nature of it isn't important. The overall story is you're switching out like a hydrophobic for a hydrophilic amino acid, and that affects the folding of the, of, um, the cytoskeleton that leads to uh, sickle cell-shaped cells for sickle cell anemia. That's a one single uh, mutation that causes that. And if anybody's interested, uh, sickle cell disease is uh, an adaptation to malaria. Malaria has killed more people in the world than just about anything else. That's going to change, though. There, we're, we're getting some malaria vaccinations. <laughs> okay. That's primary structure, straightforward. Sequence of your amino acids. Secondary structure. This is formed by hydrogen bonding of your polypeptide backbone. Okay? So think about this. Got my backbone here. Let's draw in everything. And what you see here On this polypeptide backbone, okay, carbon to oxygen. Is this a polar or a nonpolar covalent bond? It's polar. Where are the electrons spending most of their time? Near the oxygen. And why? Why is it doing that? Why? High electronegativity. Why is it more electronegative than the carbon? More protons. That's awesome. You guys did good. You know, that's a, a, a deep layer of understanding. So partial negative, nitrogen and hydrogen, polar or nonpolar covalent bond. Polar, who's more electronegative? Nitrogen, so it's this, so positive. Well, actually, partial positive, right? Okay, so, hey, we've got some partial charges. Can we form hydrogen bonds? You bet, you bet. So the secondary structure of a protein is formed by hydrogen bonding of the backbone. The side chains are not involved with secondary structure. And there are two basic types of secondary structure, alpha helices and beta pleated sheets. So a beta pleated sheet, imagine it's going like this. So you can stretch it and they'll snap right back. Hydrogen bonds are easily broken, but they'll reform. And then imagine the, the alpha helix, it's a coil, and you can stretch it, let it go, and it snaps back. Okay. We good? And that's just showing the secondary structure from your alpha helices or your beta pleated sheets.
Okay. No, don't need all these things here. All right. Next, we've got primary, secondary, obviously tertiary structure comes next. This is where we start having the side chains interact with themselves and with the environment around them. So you got hydrophobic interactions. It says van der Waals interactions. Are, are, are you guys familiar with van der Waals forces or no? like the dispersion reaction or the dispersion forces and whatnot, correct? Yeah, so your electrons are moving around, right? But then they, they start moving in opposite places of each other and you get like these fleeting dipole moments, right? Which causes them to attract. I think I got that right, didn't I? Yeah, yeah. I, I always forget my chemistry sometimes here. But yeah, so these things, these van der Waals forces are weak. They're weaker than a hydrogen bond, but they do help hydrophobic molecules stick together. They're a good way to tell how weak they are is methane, ethane, propane are all liquid. I mean, sorry, are all gas at room temperature. But when you get it to octane, octane is actually a, a liquid. It's a van der Waals forces. You can see that like you can have ionic bonds from your charged side chains. That would be really strong. And same with your disulfide bridge, which is right here. It's called a disulfide to sulfurs. Forms a covalent bond. Covalent bonds are strong. Ionic bonds are strong. So in this case, these you can see that loop right there would be held together pretty tightly. Whereas up at the top, where you got the hydrophobic interactions, that would be a much weaker form of holding that together. Good? Okay. And this is just showing we're getting our tertiary structure. This is our three-dimensional structure of the protein is formed in large part by these interactions of the side chain. Okay. Yeah. And, you know, these tertiary structures are incredibly, incredibly diverse. Like I said, we, we talked about they can be used as enzymes, enzymes for a very specific reaction. They could be motor proteins, and there's different types of motor proteins, signaling molecules, signal receptors, structural transport. Like I said, there's lots and lots of different ways that these things can be useful. Okay. We got primary structure, secondary, tertiary, and now we have quaternary. This, of course, is the fourth layer. All proteins, of course, are going to have uh, primary through tertiary structure because your tertiary structure is just your 3D shape of your molecule. However, some or some proteins like hemoglobin are, have a quaternary structure. And what we're doing here is we're taking two or more polypeptides and putting them together to form a protein. So the protein still has a three-dimensional shape, but it's based on more than one polypeptide. So like in your hemoglobin, I believe there's four different subunits. Okay. That's just showing the different types there. Okay. That's that's it for protein structure and uh, from primary through quaternary. Okay. How about folding? Man, going through this quick today. Yeah. Whatever, let me, okay, that's a good question. Let me just go, let's see here. Okay, so often you'll see these three-dimensional computer-generated models, right? And what's going on here is the different colors represent, these different colors will represent the different peptides. So this would be the quaternary structure of a specific protein. You can see the different peptides in here. It also has arrows on it. So this would be the nitrogen here, this would be the carboxyl here, right? Now, when you see like a helical, a helicy, that's an alpha helicy right there. That's another alpha helicy. When I showed you that G protein coupled receptor, it's got alpha helices that go through the, the membrane. And then I don't know if there's a beta pleated sheet in here that you can see, but you would see something that looks wavy like that. So like in things that are stretchy, in proteins that have to be stretchy, 
you'll see those big the pleated sheets and I, I don't know where I'd see one in here. I'm, yeah. So like based off of the primary or the secondary structure, would you be able to tell it's tertiary structure? That is a fantastic question. Uh, you got ahead of me a little bit there, but that's a fantastic question. And the answer is um, until recently, not so well. Not so well. But since the question was asked, let me go ahead and address it a little bit. Um, before we start talking about protein folding here. Um, yeah, I'll go ahead and talk about it. This is kind of fun, actually. We were talking a little bit about this before class. So if we go back to, let's see, for those of you following at home, we're on 3-3, three, three, uh, slide number 38. If you remember that picture I just showed you, Let's take a look here. There's a, I just switched to slide 39. The first way we were able to discover proteins was quite labor intensive. Use what's called X-ray crystallography. And what you would do is you would take a protein and I don't exactly know the process because I've never done this before, but you basically crystallize it and then you shoot it with an X-ray and then you would have to interpret the X-ray imagery of it to show you what I'm talking about. Look, um, there's a very famous image here from one of my heroes in science, Rosalind Franklin. Woman did like, she did like the work of like two Nobel prizes before the age of 35. Like seriously, two Nobel prizes at the age of 35 as a woman in science. Didn't earn one, didn't get one because she died. Yeah. Um, would this be the same thing as uh, what they described as X-ray diffraction using crystals? Is that the exact same thing as this? I don't know. Okay. I don't know, actually. It's a little bit out of my area of expertise as proteins and how they, how they uh, get them. But the way they used to do it was you basically, you, you, had to extract the protein or extract your molecule, purify it, and then shoot it with an X-ray. Uh, Rosalind Franklin in the early 50s was a world expert on this X-ray crystallography process. And they would take, see, this is photo 51 that uh, was given to Watson and Crick, who you probably know as the discoverers of their discovery of uh, DNA, right? The structure of DNA. We, we knew about it, but they didn't know what it looked like until they publish their data. That's what they used. She got an acknowledgement. I know. Uh, it just kind of gets me so upset about that. We got to get off the subject. But basically, this was really labor intensive. And that's how we discovered the shape of most proteins. So not only did you have to have the lab techniques to basically isolate a protein and then take an x-ray picture of it, you had to be able to interpret what that image meant. And of course, Watson and Crick were smart guys, and he immediately looked at it and said, oh my gosh, it's a double helix. But you can imagine that there's a serious amount of expertise that goes into that. So for years, that was the way we, we, um, we discovered or figured out the, the, the structure of proteins was through this process called X-ray crystallography. But it posed a real problem for us. And one of those problems was Imagine trying to isolate a protein that's embedded in a membrane, right? So it's embedded in a, in a hydrophobic medium. It's embedded in fat, basically. So the minute you would try to pull it out and isolate a protein from your cellular membranes, the proteins would just fall apart. So we were never, a, we were very limited. It was labor intensive. It would take sometimes years to figure out a protein. And some of them, you just couldn't get them. Now there's a, but as we finally started making uh, more and more images, we were able to create computer images of, of these proteins. And now we use AI, which is a form of machine learning, where we've plugged in all the proteins that we know, 
and what their shape is. And we've plugged in their sequence of amino acids. So as I was talking about earlier, right? Science is kind of changing. You know, at the beginning of class, I got up here and I talked about the process of science of, you know, making observations, formulating, asking questions, formulating a hypothesis, testing your hypothesis, interpret the data, repeat, right? Now with AlphaFlow and this AI, which is a form of machine learning, what they're able to do now is, well, they fed in every protein we know, the sequence of amino acids for every protein that we know, and now it's learned. And one of the things it's learning to do is like figure out the shape of proteins based on the sequence of amino acids or based on the genes. Because if we know the genes, we, we know what the amino acids are going to be because we cracked the genetic code back in the 60s. So now um, it's pattern searching, right? You, you, you have a gene, it'll give you the sequence of amino acids. And now this alpha flow is like able to figure out its structure. Um, I can't tell you like how revolutionary this is going to be for us. I mean, right now, like, I, I talked about being in a revolution uh, in astronomy right now, but at the molecular level, at the cellular level, we're in a real revolution because the other, the other thing that limited us for a long time was getting your sequence. Now we can sequence your DNA rapidly. Now we can sequence your DNA, plug it into AlphaFlow, figure out the proteins, figure out what they look like. So about five or six years ago, I got up in these classes and I would say, hey, right now we're in a revolution because we have CRISPR technology where we can like finely tune your DNA by making small changes to it. We're moving beyond that now in just five years. Now we're moving to, we know what the protein looks like. If we need to make a spike protein for our bodies to recognize to fight off a virus. We can sequence the DNA of that virus very quickly, know what the protein looks like, and now we can make our own DNA or messenger RNA so our body can be, so we can program our body to fight a, to fight a very specific virus and we can do it incredibly fast. They had a working virus within a month of discovering coronavirus. Within a month, two months maybe. You get the idea. It's not years. It's months. And uh, because of this right here, we have gone from we can manipulate your genes at a very fine scale to now we'll be able to create our own proteins and have our body make those proteins for us or engineer any bacteria or and get your vaccinations in a banana or a chicken egg. Well, some of them anyways, because your stomach acid changes the proteins that denatures them, as we'll talk about. Um, so, yeah, I mean, you got me off on a tangent, but I was going to talk about it on Thursday. But I'm glad you asked the question, because to me, this is like I'm getting goosebumps thinking about this right now. I, I'm serious because the the rate at which our technology is, is, is um, advancing based on now how we can figure out these proteins and the structure of them we're we're gonna have some huge medical breakthroughs very soon which is interesting because when i took a biology class like 30 years ago the teacher gets up and goes within 20 years i'll be able to you know grow limbs back well, it's been 30 and we're not that close to it we still aren't that close to it but when it comes to like treating cancer diseases designer medicines reprogramming your DNA, your body, your, or your immune system, we're, we're, we're getting really close. And I just said, like, I think we, we're trying, we have uh, HIV vaccines in trial using this type of technology here. There's a vaccine age and out there, they're working on malaria. If, if uh, the coronavirus were to um, mutate again, we could come up with another vaccination very quickly. And in fact, they're they're even talking about vaccinations that will permanently, or at least for a few years, stop all flus, all coronaviruses. It's in the works now. So we're in exciting times. 
yeah. That was fun to talk about. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Any questions, comments? Do you guys feel excited about the times we live in right now? I know it's hard. We're all masked up. Nobody likes wearing them. Or at least I, my nose is hurting from this thing pulling on my face. Personally, I love the mask one. I don't have to show my face. <laughs> Yeah, I have to lecture for five hours a day, so it's kind of rough. Okay, I keep going to the wrong one here. Okay, well, that was really fun. Thank you. Okay. Um, wow. Gonna get through this in one day. Okay, so basically, uh, protein structure. Now that we know that we're getting very good at determining protein structure, there's a couple interesting things about it. We know they fold. But protein shapes can be flexible. And if a protein actually loses its shape too much, it denatures. So these, these are just different ways of looking at protein shape from a ribbon model to a space filling model. This is kind of your three dimensional structure showing everything in there. And then of course, some proteins are very large. And this is showing um, our antibody protein and a protein from a flu virus. You see the antibody lines up to it nicely. So part of this alpha flow is whenever we discover a new virus, we can sequence this DNA, figure out what those viral proteins look like, and then go engineer an antibody. So one of the ways we're doing science differently now is we're plugging in lots and lots of data, and we have AI looking for correlations. And I know everybody's immediately good, you know, correlation does not equal causation, right? But if we start getting you know, correlations that happen all the time, then we can work on you know, looking at those proteins and seeing if we actually got it right. Yeah. So typically our immune systems would take a very long time to do this because they're cycling through the different uh, receptors. Yes. Uh, so, but with an alpha flow, you'd be able to figure that out instantly, right? Yeah, like I said, they had a working you know, vaccination within a month. I mean, or a couple months. Yeah. I mean, one of the, one of the fears of people is that like this, vi the, the, the vaccinations are not vetted. We did it too quickly. And what they fail to under, or they don't know is that our technology has changed that much. That's how fast our technology works. Yeah. It's crazy. It's, it's very promising. Okay. So basically, uh, whenever you get protein folding, I mean, every polypeptide that's going to become a protein has to fold into that protein, and it can do it spontaneously, or sometimes they need help. And uh, so things like the peptides of your that form your hemoglobin, you put those in water, and they'll actually spontaneously will fold into the correct shape. And I like... I love the way the book described this actually like, Hey, wait a second. How did this polypeptide fold into this shape? Isn't that creating order? Isn't that, you know, creating order? Doesn't that go against the laws of thermodynamics, right? Where everything's trying to like increase entropy. And here's the thing spontaneously folding into shape. We don't violate the laws of thermodynamics, not here, not in the past, not in the present, not to the ends of the universe. What happens is when a protein folds into shape, always remember this. Anytime you form a bond, ionic bond, covalent bond, hydrogen bond, energy is released. So as these proteins fold into shape, they're forming bonds with each other, with those, with those side chains. And when those bonds form, well, they're releasing energy into the environment. So they've increased entropy overall, even though the protein has folded into the correct shape. And it's just showing the shape of a hemoglobin molecule. And you can see it's, it's got four different peptides that come together to form the quaternary structure. Other proteins cannot fold on their own. In fact, a lot of them cannot. And you have another protein called a chaperone or chaperonin that actually helps proteins fold. So here it is. We've even got proteins helping proteins fold into the correct shape. And uh, these are a couple different types of uh, chaperonins. There's, of course, lots of them. 
and you would find them in your cytoplasm and inside what's called your, well, we won't get into rough endoplasm reticulum right now. Proteins are flexible. Here's a good example, right? That's an excitable protein or muscle. My, they're contracting. Those proteins shapes are changing to cause a muscle contraction. Some are elastic. You can stretch them, they'll come right back. Uh, and this is also showing uh, denatured protein, which I'll come back to. And another thing is that proteins might exist in different shapes. So motor protein, imagine this is a part of your cytoskeleton, literally moves like this. It just changes the shape and it causes it to walk right down parts of your cell's cytoskeleton. That's changing shape. So they exist in one of two shapes. A sodium potassium pump, one shape, another shape, They're just going back and forth like this. Uh, you might have an enzyme. An enzyme can be on or off. It's not making whatever the product is or it's making it. And the on and off, you can activate and deactivate your proteins. And a lot of your protein enzymes, like I said, are, are highly regulated inside the cell, constantly being turned on and off. Okay. Flexible protein folding. And then uh, proteins can also denature. You guys have all cooked eggs, right? This is your, this is an egg. This is an egg on a frying pan. And if you're from my generation, this is your brain. This is your brain on drugs. <laughs> and my friend gave me a shirt one time that said, this is your brain on drugs with two pieces of bacon. And it had like eggs and bacon. Well, I don't know how much I, I like that uh, ad campaign, but it did show something really good. It showed denaturing. You know, an egg, when you pull it out, I mean, we all know it's like kind of, I don't know, slimy, right? It's all those egg proteins. You throw it in a frying pan and it immediately hardens up. It, it turns from liquid to solid. Those proteins denature. They change shape because of heat. So there are ways you can denature a protein. When you denature a protein, what you're doing is you're causing that protein to lose its shape. And uh, almost specifically, you're causing it to lose its biological function. So denaturing is different than turning it on or off, right? Like an enzyme. But if you denature it, it can lose shape. So the proteins in these eggs have lost their shape. That's why it's dangerous to get heat stroke because you've overheated to the point where the proteins in your body are beginning to denature. They're falling apart because it's too hot. There's too much kinetic energy. The proteins can't hold themselves together, right? All those hydrogen bonds are breaking. And the problem with that is that when you cool an egg off, does it revert back? No. So a lot of times when a complex protein denatures, that's it, it's done. Your body has to like basically destroy or digest that protein. Okay, I think that's, yeah. Um, one of the problems with uh, proteins is uh, they get damaged and they don't function correctly. If you also damage parts of your cells that help the proteins fold, your proteins won't fold correctly and you accumulate this damage inside of your cells. That's part of our aging process, it kind of sucks. We accumulate these damaged proteins and membranes. Okay, uh, let's see. And then lastly, protein folding can be contagious. Yeah, talking about some crazy stuff here. Uh, one of the reasons why um, I always put the caveat for something to be living is that it, it reproduces, copies that information that's to ensure the continuity of life so it can evolve, right? There's lots of things that reproduce like a virus that may or may not be living. There's proteins that can also cause other proteins to fold in a certain way and they're called prions. And uh, they're, you get them from eating like, there was one that you'd eat like brain tissue and it would get in there and like Crashville Jacobs, like, is that right? I can't remember. Yeah, there's, is that it? Crashville Jacobs, you get it from Eating there's, brain tissue. Uh, three diseases that have the same effect, and there was some um, 
village area that when they established contact a few years earlier, um, and they were observing this village and basically they were practicing cannibalism yeah. to honor the dead and they were eating the brain tissue, which would infect their brains. Right. And they'd eventually become vegetables. Yeah. Oh yeah. Because it caused all the brain, the, fold, the certain proteins in their brain to fold incorrectly. So they no longer functioned. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think there's also the mad cow disease that went around a few years ago. That was pretty scary. So interestingly, these prions can actually like, get passed on and remain dormant for years and then all of a sudden they pop in yeah thanks for adding in okay let's see here well there is my alpha fold that i was going to talk about for latest discoveries but i can't believe i just did this but i think i just finished the chapter i don't think i've ever gone through proteins that fast i hope i didn't go too fast for you guys I think I talked about everything. Well, all right. I'll come up with something else to talk about on Thursday. Just watch your email. It, it, there, there's a good chance that, um, that things will not go well for having class on Thursday. And if you, if we, if we do have class and you don't feel like you can come, always remember I'll be live streaming. Yeah. Yeah, you, exactly. The pH, like if you if you marinate fish and like lemon juice, you'll see the fish looks like it's cooked. So pH, salinity, you can change the salts because that will change your ionic bonds. And then also, of course, heat. Yeah. We talk more about that in uh, the next uh, in a later chapter on on enzymes and metabolism. But good question. Thanks for asking. Yeah, I mean, um, I based. Also, if you have, like, 